Good afternoon. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much to Linda and Clay for the invitations to the National Academies of Medicine for organizing uh, this session. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the future of virtual trials, but, but first I want to say that current clinical trials are expensive, inaccessible, and in many cases are failing. The status quo is increasingly unacceptable, and if we don't have changes, we're not going to be able to address some of the greatest health challenges of our time. So what's the evidence uh, for that statement? So this is uh, research from Demasi and colleagues, which shows that the cost of drug development is rising. It's rising exponentially, and it's doubling uh, every 12 years. So in 1979, the cost of developing a new drug, including the cost of failure, was about $200 million. Now, 2016, it's 10 times as much and $2.6 billion. Uh, similarly, uh, the productivity in the pharmaceutical sector has been declining and been declining exponentially for the last 50 years. It's all Craig's fault. Um, the number of new molecular entities per billion dollars in R&D spend has been de uh, declining, um, suggesting that the way we're doing things is not uh, the right approach. While the rest of the, law, rest of the world is following Moore's law, a doubling of productivity uh, every 18 months, for example, in computer chips, the pharmaceutical industry is going the entirely opposite way. Clinical trials are inaccessible. Less than 5% of people with certain conditions uh, participate in clinical trials. And if you think about it, we couldn't design it much worse. Uh, we ask individuals who are generally sick uh, to come to research sites and see generally healthy research lo researchers like me on my terms. Uh, we should be, we healthy researchers should be seeing sick patients uh, and sick participants on their terms. We ask research participants to volunteer uh, in clinical trials that often a significant financial and time burden to them and to their families. We ask them to volunteer to be exposed to risks no, non, known and unknown of experimental therapies, and we ask them to do it on our terms. I can't think of a less participant-centered way of doing research. And uh, current drug development is long, inefficient, and likely to fail. This is from the uh, uh, from pharma. This is widely seen and often uh, done with some pride. But if you look at this, it's craziness. Uh, it's failure, and it's a, a model that's designed to fail and designed to fail over long periods of time and at great cost. Uh, I'm a neurologist. I care for people with neurological disorders, and neurological disorders are now the leading source of disability in the world. Uh, one out of six women in this room will develop Alzheimer's disease. One out of 10 men in this room will develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, failure rates for Alzheimer's disease clinical trials are 99%. Uh, I care for people with Parkinson's disease, the fastest growing neurological disorder in the world. Uh, one out of every 15 of us in this room will develop uh, Parkinson's disease. The most effective therapy for Parkinson's disease is 50 years old. So two of the greatest health challenges of our time, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and we're completely failing and have been failing for half a century, that suggests that we need new approaches and new tools. Fortunately, we have those new tools. Um, they're uh, transforming the way we do everything. So uh, one of the dominant models in care will be the migration of care away from institutions like hospitals and clinics to the home and mobile devices. We're seeing this in telemedicine. We're even seeing it in acute stroke care, where uh, acute stroke care has now migrated to the curbside with CT-enabled ambulances to provide acute stroke care. We see it in banking. How many people have been to a bank teller in the last 30 days? How many people have banked from home in the last 30 days? And how many people have banked on a mobile device? In the so these are the same things that happen in banking, happen in travel services, happen in retail, and needs to happen in research. We need to make research more accessible, more convenient, and lower costs. Uh, seven years ago, Craig uh, already, already disappeared on me. Um, uh, he launched, launched a completely virtual trial called Remote, really groundbreaking uh, work in which they did all aspects of the clinical trial were done entirely remotely. They think they had one uh, uh, site that was uh, in, in, in the study and really laid the groundwork for much of the work that many of the individuals in this room are now conducting. And uh, while he did an entirely uh, virtual study, in the near term, we think that many aspects of a clinical trial can be virtual. This is just one schematic of looking at the various stages of a clinical trial from recruitment, pre-screening, enrolling, conducting interim assessments, final assessments, and following individuals longitudinally. Um, some of these things can be done uh, centrally and remotely from a single site, like pre-screening has recently been done by Dr. Richard Finkel and his colleagues in a, a trial of 
a rare neurological disorder affecting babies called uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Maybe enrollment is done at in individual sites where people undergo detailed assessments, MRIs, biopsies, blood work, spinal fluid uh, assessments. But interim assessments can be done on mobile devices that can provide you objective data. Final assessments, people could come back in for uh, final assessments, and then people could be followed oftentimes ad infinitum, especially for biological therapies for safety purposes to see how people do over long periods of time. Uh, Andy Korovos, who's in the back, uh, wrote this great piece on decentralized clinical trials, and she created a model that looks at two questions. The first is on the y-axis, where are the data captured? Are they captured at a site, or are they captured, for example, in somebody's home, direct to patient, or direct to a research participant? And the second question is, how are the data captured? Are they captured via an intermediary? Someone like me doing an exam on someone's Parkinson's disease and telling someone with Parkinson's disease how well they're doing or not doing? or having, the, having um, uh, nurses do similar types of assessments, or are they doing assessments on smartphones and getting objective uh, data that tell people how they're doing in real world settings the 99.9% .9 of the time that they're not uh, in a research site. And the remote study that Craig did was really a groundbreaking that it went far away, far off the graph almost in terms of how the data captured or where the data are captured but there was likely to be many decentralized research models that combine various aspects of traditional research and decentralized ones. Uh, so some examples of these new approaches, uh, these are from the ones that we've been fortunate to be part of. So about five or six years ago with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, we did a virtual research study. They have now, I think, 30,000 individuals who signed up through something called Fox Trial Finder, individuals with and without Parkinson's disease who have signed up to participate in future uh, clinical trials, um, these all individuals had self-reported Parkinson's disease, and they wanted to know, do these people with self-reported Parkinson's disease indeed have Parkinson's disease? So then rather than setting up research sites around the country to have people in the Fox Trial Finder go to those research sites to be seen some like me, we had someone like me see them in their homes virtually. Uh, Parkinson's disease is a visually assessed disorder, uh, visually assessed disorder, as are many other conditions, especially in dermatology or psychiatry. And so we saw 160-some participants in 39 states, all from a single site, without a research participant having to travel anywhere. And we were able to get enormous geographical representation in the study. You can see we had uh, participants in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We had people in Pensacola, Florida. We had people throughout the South and Southeast and Central California, all participating in this. Uh, you know, I don't even know what parts, of some of these parts of the country. I'm not even sure what they, what cities are even there. Um, uh, participating in research studies that previously they would have no means uh, for doing so. And then we asked the participants what they thought, and they basically liked virtual visits. And this is five or six years ago when the technology wasn't as good as it is today. Overall satisfaction, 90 plus percent were satisfied or very satisfied. At the end, 80 percent of participants said they'd be more willing, and 85 percent of participants said they'd be more able to participate in future research studies if they could do so remotely. Similar research has been uh, found to be the case for uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease as well. Uh, we're also fortunate uh, to receive a recent NIH uh, grant uh, to follow uh, participants from two phase three studies, both large multicenter uh, clinical trials in Parkinson's disease, 400 some participants, 300 some participants, 30 sites around the US. And we're going to follow them. The studies are winding down. And rather than lose those participants and all the data that they contributed, we're going to follow them but follow them in their home remotely without them having to travel to a single research site. We're going to do annual uh, virtual visits with them just using simple video-based, web-based video conferencing. We tend to use uh, software from a company called Zoom. Uh, individuals will report uh, patient report outcomes through a uh, platform called Fox Insight that has tens of thousands of uh, participants in it, and they have, they'll do that quarterly. And then monthly, they'll do assessments on a smartphone that can measure everything from tremor to gait, to voice, to balance, uh, all the simple devices that we carry around with us everywhere that we go. Uh, with 23andMe, the direct-to-consumer uh, genetics company, uh, we're going to recruit, characterize, and retain a national cohort of LARC2 carriers. LARC2 is the most common genetic mutation uh, for Parkinson's disease, probably responsible for about 2% of cases with Parkinson's disease. So this is a, in one way, look at it as a rare uh, genetic cause for a disorder. If you were to, to do a traditional study, you'd have to set up multiple sites around the country or around the world uh, to recruit participants, have them come into research sites, and follow them longitudinally. 
and the vast majority of these large two carriers, 250 of them, do not even have Parkinson's disease. So we're going to be able to follow these individuals remotely in their homes or wherever they want to be followed with annual virtual visits uh, with them, doing standard Parkinson's exam examinations to see if they've developed any symptoms of Parkinson's disease, standard cognitive examinations, and a battery of other uh, tests, and follow them entirely remotely and to do so from a national study. You can imagine that in the future, if there's a drug that treats large two cases of Parkinson's disease, this would be a perfect cohort of individuals to recruit for such a study. And virtual studies offer numerous advantages uh, So compared to traditional studies. In traditional studies, there's a lot of focus uh, ideally on participants, but there's a lot of focus on investigators and sites. In virtual studies, it's really focused on participants because there are very few, if any, sites. The geographic reach of the studies is not determined by where somebody lives, but determined by who has internet access. You go from many sites and many IRBs to one or very few. The time to initiate studies can be very short. We're finding that in that at-home PD study in less than a, probably six months after we received funding. We've already enrolled our first participants. You go from many investigators to a handful of investigators, and you reduce the variability in assessments. And then you provide research participants comfort, convenience, and importantly, confidentiality that they often wouldn't get. Some individuals who carry a genetic marker for a disease do not want to be known to be carrying that genetic marker or do not want people in their community to know that they might have Parkinson's disease or they might have a psychiatric illness and may not want to be going to a psychiatric center to participate in a research study or you can imagine any number of other conditions. And finally, we think in the long term, not likely in the short term, that the costs for doing these research studies can be less. Uh, we increasingly have the tools of the future. The only thing that's stopping us from applying them is creativity and will. And I hope that this session will help us increase our creativity and galvanize our will. Thank you very much.